Today, we're in North Oak Cliff in Dallas, Texas. In 2020, it was home to James, who went by Jamie, and Jennifer Faith, who had been together for 15 years. They had met on a blind date and spoke for hours that night. They couldn't believe how much they had in common and were together from that point on. Jennifer had been married twice before and had one daughter, Amber, from her first marriage. Her husband at the time said he didn't want kids at all and the relationship had broken down when she found out she was pregnant. Jennifer said she finished her thesis, graduated and had Amber all within a month. She then married again a man named Rick, but that relationship had ended fairly quickly too. And when she met Jamie many years later, everybody said they were the perfect match. Jamie was instantly completely devoted to Jennifer and Amber. They married in Las Vegas in 2012. Amber loved Jamie like a father and asked him to adopt her and make it official. He was so emotional and he couldn't sign the papers quick enough. Jennifer said that Jamie was the only father Amber ever really knew, having been in her life since she was eight. It seemed everything had fallen into place for the three of them. Friends were so happy for the couple to have finally found each other after so many years of heartbreak for Jennifer and for Jamie, who told his friends he thought he would be single forever. They were a fun couple to be around, always up for doing something social and loving to host parties. Jennifer was in healthcare administration and Jamie had worked as an executive in the IT department at American Airlines for seven years. His friends said computers and tech were his thing going back as far as school and working his way up to a top career was always on the cards for him. He was a big gamer and sports fan too. Jamie and Jennifer lived a comfortable life and did lots of travelling together. So when US Airways and American Airlines merged and Jamie's job called for him to move, they were happy to do so. The Faith family relocated to Dallas, moving into a nice house on a quiet street the 1,000th block of South Waverley Drive. They always got each other cute gifts and presents, whether there was an occasion or not, and loved any chance for a celebration. For Valentine's that year, Jennifer had bought Jamie a personalised book, thanking him for making her life so wonderful. On October 8th, 2020, the couple celebrated the 15th year anniversary of their first date, a huge milestone. The next morning at 7.30am, the pair set out on a walk together with their dog Maggie. It was light outside, quiet and peaceful. The couple's ring doorbell picked them up as they left and headed down the street. Without warning, a masked man started approaching them from behind. He pulled out a gun and fired nine shots in very quick succession, seven of them hitting Jamie. Three bullets to his head, three to his chest, and one to his groin area. Between the shots and Jennifer screaming, people quickly started coming out of their houses. What happened? The shooter then turned his attention to Jennifer, knocking her to the floor and duct taping her wrists. He then tried to pull her rings off and even made an attempt to attack Maggie. As Jamie lay on the ground, the man snatched off his wedding ring, got into a small black truck and sped away. The smell of gunpowder filled the air as people stood looking in horror, many of them on the phone to 911. I hear the woman screaming for her life, hysterical. It sounds like a movie. So I hurry up and call the police saying, hurry and tell them I think my neighbor just got shot. Authorities got there fast, but there was nothing anyone could do. 49-year-old Jamie Faith was dead. Neighbours consoled a distraught Jennifer outside. It was such a shocking and heartbreaking scene. One minute she had been celebrating her 15-year anniversary and walking her dog. The next, her husband was shot dead right in front of her, and her life and Amber's had been turned upside down. 
A woman from Dallas is trying to cope with a sudden loss that no one should feel. Her husband was murdered on their morning walk and she had to watch it happen. Tiffany Liu has more on the case that's shaken not only their family, but the community as well. On Friday morning in Oak Cliff, a husband and wife took their dog on a walk like they always do. But that would be their last walk together. Dallas police say the couple was approached by a man in a mask on Waverly. He shot and killed 49-year-old James Faith. Typically, that's not how robberies occur. Typically, they just want your property. Um, no one goes to that extreme. Police say the suspect tried duct taping the woman's hands together to steal the jewelry off her fingers. And they say he may have been trying to abduct her. Had a mask on. She believed he was a Latin male, heavy set. Um, he ran off when she screamed for help. They believe he left in a black Nissan Titan with a Texas Ranger sticker on the back window. So I'm asking the public to help us out. Police are desperate to find the killer who took the life of Jamie Faith. Homicides are horrible. It's one of the worst crimes that you can commit. And what it does to the family, um, you really just have no idea how it just tears a family up. His wife is devastated. She tells me he was her best friend. He was the best husband and best father anyone could ask for. But as upset as Jennifer was, the police had no time to waste and she was swiftly asked to come in and give a statement. I turned around and I just saw this person shoot and shoot. <laughs> I couldn't believe, I didn't know, I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> was your husband like this? Did he say anything to him? No, I think I think I was yelling no. Mm -hmm. I think he did the same thing. It just seemed quiet. That's all I remember. The shots. And several shots. Well, a lot of shots. Uh, six, five, six, maybe. I feel like. Mm -hmm. For something like this to happen in broad daylight was staggering, and no one could draw any conclusions as to who would want Jamie dead. But sadly, police said Jamie's murder was one of many violent crimes in Dallas that year. The city reported more than 200 homicides in 2020 alone. Even though this was the case, it seemed whoever had done this, they were brazen and took a big risk. It all seemed so personal and so intentional. Was it possible that Jamie knew his killer, or was it a robbery that had gone horribly wrong? But he had been shot before anything was taken from him. It seemed that the theft was an afterthought. Why such a brutal killing? Was duct taping Jennifer a potential attempt at an abduction? There were so many layers and so much to unpack. All Jennifer could tell them was that the shooter was male and quite broad, wearing a blue face mask and a dark hoodie. She said he had really dark and piercing eyes too. Another neighbour that had ran out to help confirmed that same description. We got up, we did our normal good morning thing and I heard running behind me and I turned around and then just shooting just started. I was running up this driveway and uh, he tackled me and started beating on me and taped my hands together. We just really need some answers. If anybody knows anything, please contact the detective. Somebody has got to know whose truck this is because it was a, it's a black Nissan Titan extended cab. It had a, um, 
uh, Texas Ranger sticker in the back window. And so it's, it was very distinctive from that point. I'm sure they're overextended and spread very thin, but it doesn't, it doesn't help me in terms of finding the answers that I really need. We actually had been here three years to the day we signed uh, for our house when this happened. So you bought this house October 9th, three years ago? Correct. Same day your husband is murdered. And the day prior to that on October 8th, we had just celebrated being together for 15 years. Oh my God. If you know what happened, I need I need that for closure. I need to make some sense out of this. It's been horrible, devastating. I teeter between completely heartbroken and completely devastated every day. Amazingly caring, very kind. He would give you the shirt off his back. My partner, my best friend. I just, I'm not supposed to be widowed at 48, you know? I just hope that at some point, maybe this person can recognize the gravity of what they've done and feel some sort of guilt enough to come forward. The only clues that the police had were that the bullets had come from a 45 caliber pistol and the vehicle that was seen speeding away was a black Nissan Titan with a T sticker on the back. A T they assumed stood for the Texas Rangers, making them think that the killer was at least living in that area. Detectives need any and all information that might be related to the case. A GoFundMe was set up to help support Jennifer with funeral costs and support hers and Amber's lives without Jamie. It soon raised over $60,000. The person organising it for Jennifer said she couldn't believe how fast the money was pouring in. Everyone wanted to help in any way they could. The neighbours took it in turns to make Jennifer meals and keep her company, making sure she was keeping her strength up and was never alone. Soon, more than 50 families around the neighbourhood were helping in delivering groceries and household items. Crime Stoppers raising the reward this week to $25,000, the murder of James Faith happening in front of his wife. Do you think, sir, that this was a random robbery or something more sinister? Right now, we know that the suspect did attempt to take property, but we're not going to limit any uh, uh, j the, limit the motives behind this investigation. You know that black Nissan pickup truck, the one with the Texas Rangers decal behind the driver's side, or think you do? Call Crime Stoppers or call Detective Chris Walton, 214-671-3632. Help track down the killers of James Faith. Jennifer held two funerals for her husband one in Dallas and one in Phoenix. There were lots for people to take with numbers on to call in case they thought of something that might help with the case, everything from key rings and cards to coasters. Investigators were continuing to draw blanks. There was no one in Jamie's life that was standing out as a potential person of interest, let alone a suspect in his murder. To commit a crime like this all for a couple of rings? It seemed so extreme. Experts said it had all the markings of a professional hit, a planned ambush, not a random chance attack. Jamie had installed some ring doorbells, and the one near their back gate had picked up something quite sinister. In the early hours of the morning, just a short time before Jamie was shot, a man could be seen walking in the garden of the house next door. The house was empty at the time, so it definitely wasn't a neighbour, but his bill did seem to fit the description that Jennifer had given them. This was about 2.30am. Skulking nearby and watching the house of the person that would be dead just hours later gave the police grounds to conclude that this was not a random or impulsive robbery. This was a murder that had been planned. They needed to talk to Jennifer again to see if anything else was coming back to her, anything at all that might give them more clues. They asked to check her phone and she freely handed it over. It was here. They did find something of interest, but not at all what they were expecting. Authorities found a text she had sent to a friend talking about a man called Darren, someone she admitted to having an emotional affair with. Oddly, there were no messages between her and Darren at all, but they were able to find out his last name and where he lived. His name was Darren Lopez and he lived over 600 miles away, just outside of Nashville, on a very vast and very rural property. 
Authorities local to Darren Lopez learned that he owned the exact make and model of the vehicle they were looking for, a black Nissan Titan pickup truck with a T-sticker on it. They fed the information back to the police in Dallas and they coordinated an aerial search of his house and put him under surveillance. Sure enough, the truck was there. They obtained his bank and phone records too and with these, suddenly everything started to move a lot quicker. Despite the fact there were no messages between them on Jennifer's phone, Darren had not deleted anything. Between September 20th and October 20th, just one month, Darren and Jennifer had exchanged more than 14,000 calls and text messages, hundreds and hundreds each day. And strangely, the only time they had seemingly not had contact was the day of Jamie's shooting. A whole 28-hour period was totally silent. On October 8th, the same day Jennifer and Jamie were celebrating their anniversary, Darren got his car serviced before entering Jamie and Jennifer's address into Google Maps. His phone was then tracked as he made the almost 12-hour drive to Dallas, Texas. His cards showed that he had stopped at some gas stations on the way to top up the tank, buy a Red Bull and take out cash. As images of the truck were circulated with the all-important T-sticker on the back, Jennifer sent Darren a message with a link to an article about the case, which showed a photo of the T-sticker on the truck. She said, I woke up in a bit of a panic. Something is eating away at me, telling me you need to take the sticker out of the back window of the truck. I don't normally overreact like this. Really think you need to get that sticker off ASAP, like today. The next day, Darren picked the sticker off but it was too late, as he was already being watched and police had clocked the sticker when they flew over his house. Darren and Jennifer were suddenly their prime and only suspects. The pair actually went further back than people realised. They had dated through high school and college, but broke up after Darren finished his basic training and was deployed to Korea. Jennifer moved on and married her first husband and the pair lost contact. Darren would also marry and have four daughters, but in 2018, he and his wife had parted ways. Friends said after the split and leaving the army, he had become increasingly isolated. While serving, he had suffered a brain injury when a bomb at the side of the road in Iraq went off, killing 19 of his friends. When he left the army, he was dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, and this, coupled with where he lived and his ongoing divorce, meant his feelings of loneliness were amplified. His daughters soon moved out to live with their mother and when the pandemic hit, his friends really worried that he would retreat even further. But Darren decided to use it as a chance to reach out to old friends. In March 2020, Darren made contact with Jennifer via an email he'd found on LinkedIn, seven months before Jamie was murdered. In his first email, he said he had been following her on social media for a couple of months. He talked about his life, his children, reminisced about their past together and told them that she unknowingly helped him to get through 20 years in the army. He admitted he had wanted to write to her for a while and said he had been thinking of her a lot over the years. Jennifer replied a few hours later and seemed practically giddy about the email. She said she too had been searching for him. She even knew he had lost his father in 2015. Her email was far longer and more in-depth than Darren's had been, and she was going into immense detail about every part of her life, family, marriages, attaching pictures too. She signed her email off by saying, I'm certain you weren't expecting a book of response back to you, but once I started typing, I couldn't stop. I really hope you're doing well and you were happy. I have definitely missed you over the years and there have been so many times I've wanted to talk to you. Thank you for being persistent in looking for me. Love, Jen. Before long, they were having an emotional affair, talking about five-year plans and how they wanted to be together one day. Jennifer called him her soulmate, but Darren said he was hesitant, and although there were feelings there, he didn't want to break up her marriage. Jennifer told him there was no intimacy between her and Jamie anymore, and Darren said she needed to be honest with him and tell him how she felt. 
but it still felt like a piece of the puzzle was missing. They continued to look into the emails and recover ones that had been deleted. As they did this, Jennifer, none the wiser, was trying to get hold of the life insurance. In November 2020, she initiated a claim with Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, seeking $629,000. But she found out that until they could rule her out as a suspect, she was unable to withdraw anything. She sent Darren a text message, and the pair seemed confident they would get the money eventually, and discussed buying a house together in Tennessee. Jennifer had given Darren a lot of money and gifts since they first started talking, including a new TV and two credit cards. Credit cards that she paid off with the $60,000 she received from the GoFundMe. Darren was in big trouble financially. His house was about to be foreclosed on after he had failed to make mortgage payments for several months, and his water had been shut off too. In one email, Jennifer wrote to him, Here's both of my major CCs. Amex has no limit, and I think the Visa has like $35,000. Please, don't hesitate to use them for whatever you need, especially when it's stuff for the girls. As 2021 came around, the police finally felt they had enough to move in and arrest Darren, but before they did, they wanted to see if the pair slipped up any more. On January 10th, the detective set up a meeting with Jennifer. Before the meeting, she sent Darren a message and said, Don't text me Monday. I'm going to factory reset my phone on Sunday night after deleting texts. If asked about you, you are an old friend going through a divorce. We talk every night because I am helping slash giving support with the girls, just in case they pulled phone records and ask. The next day, January the 11th, 2021, they showed up at Darren's house with handcuffs. Police in Tennessee arrested 48-year-old Darren Lopez, this man here, on Monday, and he's now being charged with murder of a Texas man. After police say he allegedly drove from Tennessee to Dallas to shoot his ex-girlfriend's husband in October of 2020. The warrant describes Faith only as a witness. She didn't answer our call for comment Tuesday and isn't facing charges. He was arrested on a state murder charge and was charged with a federal gun crime. He pleaded not guilty to both and was held on a million dollar bond. In his house, they found the same gun they were looking for in connection with Jamie's murder, confirmed via ballistics testings, and he had credit cards in Jennifer's name. Traces of Jamie's blood were later found on the gun too. In his car, a blue face mask thought to be worn on the day of Jamie's murder was also found. Jennifer was spoken to again following his arrest, but she denied there was anything inappropriate going on between the pair, saying they were just close but the woman who just couldn't stop talking was now very quiet. She had been asking for help in finding her husband's killer for months, and now they had arrested someone, but suddenly she didn't have anything to say. A week later, Jennifer transferred $118,000 from her checking account to an account belonging to an undisclosed third party. A few days after that, she asked someone else to send a message to Darren, I've just needed to be cautious because every communication is being monitored. Please tell him ASAP that I will always be his. Darren responded via the same person and said, Please stay strong for us. The walls were caving in on Jennifer. And less than a month later, in February 2021... 48-year-old Jennifer Faith is now facing obstruction of justice charges related to the murder investigation of her husband. A charge she pleaded not guilty to but the investigation was far from over and more was coming out by the day. They had been going through their emails and recovering them, slowly but surely. It turned out that just a few months after they had started talking, things had taken a dark turn. As well as Jennifer emailing Darren from herself, she set up a fake email account under Jamie's name, and using this, she started up correspondence with Darren. The first email was immediately graphic and aggressive and detailed a long list of physical and sexual abuse Jamie had inflicted on Jennifer. It also included photos of alleged injuries. But it was all Jennifer and the pictures would turn out to have come from stock image sites. Not a shred of evidence ever corroborated anything that she had said about Jamie being abusive. An expert said it was all one awful lie after another. Darren replied to who he thought was Jamie and said, I've been talking with her at night because she is terrified of you. You give her nightmares. 
I will get involved to make sure she is safe and unhurt and do that in any way I can. He finished his email by saying, be the husband you say you want to be. Another email showed a picture of a wound to a person's neck, captioned with, good stuff, enjoy knowing you can't do a f***ing thing about it. This picture was in fact real, but it was from a car accident that Jennifer was involved in eight years prior. She was telling Darren that Jamie was beating her, sexually assaulting her and letting other men sexually assault her, burning her and attacking her with weapons. Jennifer was going to extreme and disturbing lengths to get Darren's attention, spreading the most vile lies about her husband and really manipulating everyone. It is unknown when or how this happened, but at some point Jamie found out about the affair. Not the lies she was saying about him, but the communication between her and Darren. He was absolutely broken by it. In August, Jennifer told a friend that she put the brakes on her relationship with Darren because Jamie was so hurt and she just couldn't do it to him. But this didn't happen. Jennifer created a second fake email account, pretending to be a friend of her and Jamie, a friend that had seen the abuse happening and wanted Darren to do something about it to save Jennifer. And finally, after several months of creating the perfect storm and web of lies, Jennifer contacted Darren by phone, asking him to kill Jamie for her. Darren said, if I didn't do something, she was going to die. I made that commitment right there. As October came around, the plan was in place. Darren made the 10-hour drive, ready to make it look like a robbery gone wrong. He snuck into the garden next door and waited for five hours until the couple went on their walk. After he shot Jamie, stole his ring and fled, he tossed his wedding ring out the window. The amount the investigation had unravelled was gobsmacking to detectives. Flash forward again to February 2021, Darren was now in prison awaiting trial, and Jennifer was also making her court appearances on the obstruction of justice charge. Jennifer wrote a letter to Darren after she learned that he had heard about the fake email accounts, and quite obviously realised, although it justified nothing he had done, he had been duped by her. Just a quick note to say, I never lied to you, and I never sent you emails from any account but mine, as me. There is a ton more I wish I could say, but I can't right now, she said in part. Despite the proof that she had created and was the person using the accounts, she still doubled down and stuck to her lies. Darren's lawyer said it took him a further six months to convince him that Jennifer had fabricated everything about Jamie. In October that year, one year after Jamie had been killed, police issued another charge to Jennifer. New this morning, the Dallas woman whose boyfriend allegedly shot and killed her husband is now charged with orchestrating the murder. A charge of use of interstate commerce in the commission of a murder for hire, an offence that carries a potential death sentence. Knowing the death penalty was on the table if found guilty, and seeing the amount of evidence against her, Jennifer Faith suddenly had a change of mind. An Oak Cliff woman has pleaded guilty in federal court to orchestrating her husband's murder with help from her out-of-state boyfriend. Jamie's family asked that she does not receive the death penalty, so prosecutors are now recommending a life sentence. She'll officially receive her sentence in May. She pleaded guilty and in return, prosecutors agreed to drop the obstruction charge and recommended a sentence of life imprisonment. As part of the plea, the prosecution wanted something they felt was very important for Jamie's family and friends. Jennifer had to admit that she was never, in any way, shape or form, abused by Jamie. She signed to say and agree that it was completely false. In February 2022. A Dallas woman who convinced a man to murder her husband will spend the rest of her life in prison for her role in the plot. On Tuesday, a federal judge sentenced Faith to life in prison. Jennifer Faith was handed a life sentence. The judge called her pure evil and ordered her to pay $6,500 in restitution to Jamie's family and a $250,000 fine. While in prison though, Jennifer requested that $200,000 from Jamie's assets were transferred to her, something detectives called spineless and showed her true character. This wasn't someone that pleaded guilty because she wanted to admit her part and show remorse. It was because she only had herself and her best interests in mind. Jennifer's second husband, Rick, also showed up and said as awful as this all was, he was actually not surprised. 
He called her the most evil person he had ever met. She told him that her first husband had abused her. It was almost identical to what she had told Darren. Rick said the stories he had heard about her first husband were so awful, so violent and so graphic, that he said he wanted to kill him. Jennifer enjoyed toying with him and seemed to relish in watching him get angry and upset on her behalf. Again, there was not a shred of evidence to suggest that she had suffered any abuse at the hands of her first husband. Despite Jennifer's plea, Darren was still pleading not guilty and in July 2023, jury selection for his trial began. His lawyer argued that because Darren believed Jennifer was facing immediate harm when he shot Jamie, this was a use of self-defence that could be considered justified under Texas law. They also argued that because of his post-traumatic stress disorder and his brain injury, he was easily manipulated and taken advantage of by Jennifer. If convicted of first-degree murder at trial, he was facing a sentence range of 5 to 99 years. If found guilty of murder in the second degree, the sentencing range would be 2 to 20 years. There was so much to present to the jury. The texts, the emails, the CCTV, the truck, the gun. Despite how many witnesses would be called, there was really only one person the public and media wanted to hear from. Darren himself. And to their surprise, he opted to testify and share his side. That alerted you or made you think that she was in serious danger more than ever before, right? Well, yes, sir. I mean, we, we were talking uh, daily. Like I said, he was starting to... Uh, uh, abuse her at that point. And also evidence that you were not texting with Jamie. So. Yes. And that really the only person you were really talking to all this time was Jennifer. Yes, sir. That, How did that make you feel? I was... I was devastated. Did Jennifer ask you to kill him? Yes. All the emotions of everybody that I've lost started thinking about, about Ethan. He was my team sergeant's son who was murdered in Kentucky that we were there with, that we couldn't stop or do anything with. My granddaughter, Skyly, she died when I was in Iraq. She drowned. And thinking about it, I was talking to my daughter Summer about it and saying, Dad, why aren't you here? And this is where she used my, my honor and my love for, for my girls. Because I would want to protect them as much as I can. I took an innocent life. I took Amber's dad from her. A man who was like me. I, my, my two oldest daughters are my stepdaughters, but they're my daughters. I would never ever hurt Amber that way. Take her dad from that. That's what gets me how Jennifer could do that. To her daughter. On cross examination, Assistant District Attorney Brandy Mitchell, Press Lopez. But you don't tell them that you're the love of your life, the woman you kissed on the Eiffel Tower, is getting gang raped. We got to do something. That never occurs to you. Yes, it does. But you don't do it. No. It's completely absurd, Mr. Lopez, that you and another grown man are bouncing back and forth doing updates on the fact that your girlfriend just got raped. The defense team has tried to show that Lopez was manipulated by Jennifer Faith and she seized on the fact that he had a brain injury and PTSD from the military. Lopez described himself as a victim, but seemed to recognize how that might appear to the jury. But I'm not going to say I'm just a total victim. No, man, that would be disrespectful to Mr. Mr. Faith. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea that Darren Lopez was justified in killing, in executing Jamie Faith. It is as absurd and unbelievable as those fake emails. Even if you give him every benefit of the doubt, even if you were to believe all of that, it still does not justify the murder of Jamie Faith. Because of his service to this country, now he viewed danger differently. Because again, you have to look at it through his eyes. You have to put yourself in his position and how he viewed things. You know what? Yes, Jennifer's not sitting in this courtroom. She's not on trial, but her acts are intertwined so much 
that she is on trial and what she did. The only way the state can get around that is by trying to say, well, Darren must have known. He had to know that these emails were fake. That's the way they, only way they're going to get around it. Because if you believe what Darren believed, that those were actual emails, then you know that she led him to do what he did. And this all started, just like my co-counsel said, in high school. He loved her. These memories were so important to him that he held on to them. Even when he first entered the military, he put them on a car. So if he was ever captured and tortured, he could use those memories to get through that traumatic event. He uses anybody the way she wants to. You heard from her prior boyfriend how she's been doing this since high school. Darren may have pulled the trigger, but she pulled down. In July 2023, almost three years after Jamie was killed, a verdict was reached. Yes. We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Darren Lopez, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. We, the jury, having previously found the defendant, Darren Lopez, guilty of murder, unanimously assess the punishment of the defendant at confinement in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 62 years and a fine of $10,000. Darren Lopez was later sentenced to 62 years in prison. The now 51-year-old said that when he was arrested, he truly believed it was worth it because he had saved Jennifer and Amber's lives from what he thought was a dangerous person. I became her weapon, I understand that. But he added that Jennifer, in his mind, was the true criminal and he was happy that she was behind bars too. He said he would file an appeal. Prosecutors said there were so many other avenues he could have taken, but that was the option he chose. Everybody did acknowledge, however, that he had shown remorse for killing Jamie and had at least admitted his part. In an interview with Dateline 2020, Darren was asked, Do you think she ever really loved you? He shrugged and said, I don't know. Sources say that Amber moved out of the area with the family dog Maggie and still talks to her mother in prison a couple of times a week. Everybody that donated to the GoFundMe was refunded. As with many cases we cover, there are more questions than answers. What made Jennifer do this? What made her think this was a good idea and the only solution? To go from being in a 15-year relationship with a man she spoke nothing but highly of to planning his murder just a few months later. To put such a twisted plot in motion, dragging Jamie's name through the mud as she did and then facilitating his demise. The rate at which this had all escalated is scary. I've not been involved in a case that had more twists and turns than this particular case, said the prosecutor Rick Calvert. It is a case as cruel, cold and calculated as it is senseless and, frankly, strange. The one thing that everyone said about Jamie Faith was that he worshipped his wife and adored his daughter Amber. He had the perfect family, the perfect job and, in his eyes, the perfect life and one he had waited a long time for. To have this life snatched away in such frightening circumstances and never knowing that the woman he thought was his soulmate had orchestrated everything. Thank you all for tuning in. If you would like to support our channel and help us to continue to make our content, we have a Patreon with many perks including exclusive episodes, behind the scenes and ad-free early access.